Our second presenter today is Samantha Tripp, who is going to tell us about 19th century debates about the flute in Italy. The 19th century witnessed a proliferation of new flute designs across Europe in the wake of industrialization that enabled mass instrument production. Although there is considerable research regarding 19th century flutes in France, Germany, and England, the Italian tradition has largely been ignored, with the exception of a volume edited by Claudio Paradiso. This scholarly neglect is despite the fact that one of the few lasting changes to Theopold Böhm's 1847 model was the addition of the Bricialdi B-flat thumb key, which was invented by Italian flutist and composer Giulia Bricialdi. Studying Italian flutists' preferences in instruments can offer evidence for how they prioritized certain musical qualities over others, and how technological advances made by the Italian instrument designers informed their aesthetic and commercial decisions. In this presentation, I will explore the various types of flutes popular in Italy in the 19th century and how they were discussed in print. I will focus on three musical concerns that appear more frequently than any others, preserving as many of the older fingerings as possible to allow for continuity of technique, improving the facility of trills through the addition of new keys and levers, and most importantly, maintaining the voice-like timbre of the old system flutes. These concerns influenced not only the instruments they chose to play, but the music that they wrote as well. In this presentation, I will begin with a brief overview of industrialization's impact on instruments, followed by a discussion of technological advances in flute design and Italian flute models, and finally a short analysis of the impact of these models on the flute repertoire. In the 19th century, musical life was irrevocably changed by both musical and non-musical revolutions, most significantly the Industrial Revolution. In addition to allowing for an expanded market for both sheet music and instruments, industrialization forever changed the way instruments were made. In this century, widespread experimentation and in instrument design yielded instruments that slowly but surely began to resemble the modern versions we know and love today. This is the century that saw more complex mechanisms in wind instruments, the rise of the valved brass, louder strings, and cast iron pianos. Many of these developments developments were necessitated by the bigger is better mentality, especially in orchestral music, that resulted in expanded ensembles and a need for instruments to produce a louder sound. Musical revolutions, such as an increased prevalence of modulation, required instruments that could play more easily in a variety of keys. The invention of new key mechanisms that facilitated these playing in these keys, while not changing the fingerings of the old system flutes too much, became the basis of many of the flute designs we will see in just a minute. In reality, however, many of these developments influenced each other in a way that makes it difficult to determine what was the cause and what was the effect. All of these interrelated factors led to the proliferation of flute designs in Italy throughout the century. The models of flutes that became popular in turn reveal the flutists' musical and aesthetic concerns. Now I'll turn my attention to several Italian flute models and their impact on flute playing. Before looking into these Italian models, however, I want to take just a quick look at foreign flutes that were popular in Italy in the 19th century. The most, many of the most popular of these were Viennese models. In comparison to the English flutes in the 19th century, flute historian Rick Wilson observes that the Viennese instruments had a more colorful tone, but were quieter and less rich in the lower register. Italian flute makers incorporated several characteristics of Viennese flutes into their own instruments including lobe or further foot joints, metal-lined head joints, rounded rectangle embouchure holes, smaller E holes, duplicate keys, and a trill key for the third octave E to D. Some of the most popular Viennese models in Italy included the Ziegler, Meyer, and Koch flutes. Some non-Viennese flutes also made their way into Italy, including Jean-Louis Toulouse's Flute Perfectionne, but these never reached the popularity of the Viennese models. Perhaps the most significant flute development of the 19th century was Theopold Böhm's 1847 flute, 
Despite a few relatively minor modifications, this flute is essentially the instrument we play today. In comparison to other countries, the Böhm flute took a relatively long time to become widespread in Italy for a variety of reasons, ranging from the lack of a central national conservatory, similar to the one in Paris, to the Italian obsession with opera that caused a preference for the bel canto like timbre of the old system flutes. Another possible reason that the flute was not adopted quickly in Italy could have been that Böhm's first flute from 1832 never seems to have made its way into the country. In comparison, the Paris Conservatoire adapted the 1832 model and subsequently the 1847 model relatively early in comparison to most other conservatories in Europe. This implies that the 1832 model was an important stepping stone that made it less difficult to switch to the Böhm flute. In fact, the only flutist who used the 1832 model in Italy was Emanuele Krakamp, who also adopted the 1847 model very quickly. Italian flutists saw many positives and negatives in this new model. The flute was praised by several important, flute, important and prominent flutists and critics for its mechanism, tone quality, intonation, and increased volume. But these were also some of the qualities that were criticized as well. Some complained that the sound of the flute did not match that of the voice, but perhaps the most common criticism of the Böhm flute was the challenging fingering system, a result of the new mechanism that Böhm invented. One of the most influential Italian flutes was Giulio Bricialdi's. Likely as a result of his difficulties in adapting to, the Berms, to Berm's fingering system, which he said he spent three years studying, Bricialdi decided to experiment with a way to combine the tone quality of the Berm flute with the easier fingerings of the old flute, but without the added complication of two F keys. In 1869, Bricialdi revealed his flute, which had a mechanism that retained many of the old system fingerings, but was cylindrical like Berm's new one. One of the few major changes to the Berm flute since 1847 was Bricialdi's invention of the B flat thumb key in 1849, which he later incorporated into the design of his own flute. His goal was to facilitate playing in flat keys by providing an alternate fingering for B flat. Berm would later invent his own B flat, th B -flat thumb key, placing it lower down on the flute, um, which he thought would be more natural because B flat is lower than B natural. And you can see that in the picture on the far left. Um, but it was Bricialdi's design that won out, and today the key is universally known as the Bricialdi B flat. Bricialdi's flute was adopted by the Reale Istituto Musicale di Firenze in 1874, likely as a result of him teaching there. And after his death, the flute remained in use for at least the first decade of the 20th century. On the whole, reviews of the flute were very positive, praising its tone quality, dynamics, intonation, and fingering system. Despite the positive reviews, however, the Bricialdi flute became a subject of the debate in 1874 when a number of critics compared the flute to Böhm's in the Gazzetta Musicale di Milano. There were two people on either side of this debate. For the Böhm flute, Michele Carlo Caputo, a pianist, and one Dr. O.C. Though I have not found any information about who Dr. O.C. really was and whether he was a flutist at all. For the Bricialdi flute, we had Raffaele Galli and Giulia Bricialdi, both professional flutists. Caputo and Dr. O.C. preferred the Berm flute's tone in all registers, the open keys that helped with smoother passage work and the better trills. Dr. O.C. complained that Bricialdi's mechanism was too complicated, and this caused him to have to stop playing mid-performance at the Teatro alla Fenice. While Caputo claimed that Bricialdi only made the flute for the money, and that he kept the all the disadvantages of the old system flute. On the other side of the debate, however, Galli argued that the Bricialdi flute is easier to learn due to the retention of the old system fingerings, has stronger high notes, and is more popular than the Böhm flute. He complained that the Böhm flute is too complicated and is not good for playing in an orchestra, though he does not elaborate on either of those statements. Bricialdi is rather defensive of his own invention, or as he refers to it, his son, and argues that the Böhm flute has its difficulties, both in the need to learn new fingerings and the contrary mo movements required by those fingerings. He also defends himself and claims that the, the incident at the Teatro alla Fenice was caused by the embouchure made by another maker and not his mechanism. 
He goes on to assert that the two flutes are actually more similar than they are different and insists that people should stop comparing them and allow musicians to make their own decisions on which model is best for them personally. And it's important to note that he did not even force his own students to play his flute. Um, this debate is most important not necessarily for what it says about these two instruments, but what it shows about the flutist's concerns when choosing an instrument, the most frequent points of discussion being the fingering systems and tone, in particular the desire for homogeneous tone throughout the range of the flute and better intonation. Several other Italian flutists also designed their own systems around the same time as Bricialdi. The most important of these was Vincenzo de Michelis' new flute, first produced in 1874. This flute maintained the fingerings of the old system flute even more so than Bricialdi's, while adding a few extra keys and levers. The design was based primarily on the Ziegler flutes and was produced until 1887. De Michelis appreciated the decreased effort in sound production of the Berm flute, but lamented that it worsened the timbre particularly in the third octave. He was happy that Bricialdi attempted to improve on Berm's design and even admitted that he succeeded in the first two octaves, but complains about the fingerings in the third octave. His comments about these flutes show several aspects that were common to many Italian flute flutists. The priority of maintaining the old flute's sound quality, the desire for the easiest possible fingerings, and the frustration with the trail fingerings on the old system flutes. Idolo Piazza, who was often very negative about new flutes, praised Demiglis' model because it could be played without having to learn a new fingering system. However, he complained about the weight of the instrument, a critique that he also leveled at both Bricialdi and Böhm. Okay, now I'm going to turn my attention to a number of more unique models of flutes invented in 19th century Italy. All these models demonstrate the prevalence of experimentation in instrument making. The first two flutes I want to mention are two flutes that are in many ways similar to the modern alto flute. The first of these is the flauto d'amore, which like the modern alto flute, is in the key of G. It is unclear exactly when this flute was invented, and it seems as though there have been several versions of this instrument throughout the century. Caputo places the invention of the flute in the 1870s, but there are flutes dating back to the 18th century, as well as flutes from outside of Italy, as is the case with Berm's version of the instrument. An anonymous author in an 1874 article of, in the Gazzetta Musicale di Milano praised the flute's tone, comparing it to an English horn, bassoon, clarinet, harmonium, and especially the cello. The flute itself, which was also compared to the human voice, was cylindrical and usually made of silver. Another alto flute-like instrument, this time an A, was never actually used in performance, but was envisioned by Verdi, for the Sacred Dance of the Priestesses in Act One, Scene Two of his 1871 opera, Aida. The key of the flute proved to be problematic for Verdi, as the unidentified manufacturer, likely one of the many Milanese flute companies, was able to create flutes in A-flat and B-flat, but not the, quote, damned A-flute that Verdi wanted. This frustrated Verdi so much that it referred to the manufacturers as cowards and imbeciles, who claimed something is impossible, saying, quote, when in such cases someone says it cannot be done, you can be sure he is an ass. After some persuasion, he did settle for hearing both the B-flat and A-flat flutes. His general opinion was that the A-flat flute was louder and had more force in both the lower and middle notes than ordinary flutes and had a, quote, sound of lamentation that he liked. He concluded that all three flutists should have an A-flat flute for the dance for the performances at La Scala. He then went to Milan for rehearsals of La Forza del Destino and was therefore able to talk to Ricordi in person. So we do not have any letters that explain why Verdi chose to revert back to the C flute for the performance. It is possible that he was not happy with the sound of the flute in the context of the orchestra or that the flutists themselves were unable to play the flute in a way that he liked. This seems reasonable, as in his letters to Ricordi, he was anxious to hear the flutes, reminding him on multiple occasions to make sure the flutists would be ready to play for him when he arrived in Milan. A flute that was more a science experiment than, any, than a flute with any major impact on the flute world was the Giorgi flute invented by Carlo Tommaso Giorgi in 1886. This flute is held vertically and has 11 holes, which were placed according to the acoustics of the instrument. Keys could be added to any of the holes to alleviate hand discomfort 
but Georgie preferred the flute to remain keyless. The reviews of the flute were largely positive, highlighting easier fingerings, elimination of both cross fingerings and different third octave fingerings, a clearer and purer tone, better intonation, and a more ergonomic design that in addition to being lighter for the musician was also less expensive. The few negative reviews focused primarily on the difficulty of playing trills and fast passages when the instrument remains keyless. The instrument was produced in both Milan and London, but does not seem to have had any major impact on flutists or composers. Instead, it is an example of how the spirit of experimentation in the 19th century impacted instrument making. In 1910, Abelardo Albizzi also invented a vertical flute, his albizophone. This flute is an early example of the modern bass flute and was the first bass flute to have a burn mechanism. Composers including Mascagni, Puccini, Leoncavallo, Boito, Giordano, Zandonai, and Gianetti were all enthusiastic about this flute, with several writing parts for it in their works. It seems that the success of the abisophone, though relatively limited, was not restricted to Italy. Friedrich Klose included the instrument in his mythic oratorio Der Sonnegeist in 1918, and Julius Schlosser described the tone as, quote, particularly round and full, almost horn-like, yet possessing its own character. Some flutists, however, believed that the, fl the flute's wide bore made it harder to play. It's particularly interesting to note how close many of the descriptions of this flute are to those of the modern transverse bass flute. Two other experiments undertaken Albizzi, by Albizzi are the flautino and the half flute. The flautino, also referred to as the flauto usinuolo, or nightingale flute, was usually pitched in G, though there are examples in F as well, lying halfway between the flute and the piccolo in the range. Overall, the flautino does not seem to have, had, have been widespread in Italy, and composers mostly seem to have stuck to using the concert flute and the piccolo in their music. A flute of much less importance, but an interesting invention nonetheless, was Albizzi's half flute in C. This flute consisted solely of the left hand holes and a handle for the right hand. The purpose of this instrument is unclear, but Albizzi's idea may have been to help flutists learn to play harmonics. All of these flutes that I have mentioned largely disappeared and did not have any lasting impact on the flute world, but they are demonstrative of the experimentation that occurred throughout the century and how musicians and instrument makers reacted to the revolutions and changing demands around them. In addition to revealing flutist concerns, the plethora of flute models in the late 19th century significantly influenced the methods and repertoires of the flute. Each method, each method was generally written for the specific flute that the author played. This is just one of the possible reasons why there are so many methods written in Italy in the 19th century. Some method books written for particular models include Emanuele Karkamp's Metodo per il flauto cilindrico alla Böhm, the first method for the Böhm flute written in Italy, Cesare Ciardi's Metodo elementare per flauto for the old system flute, and Vincenzo de Michelis's Metodo per flauto nuovo sistema and Giulia Bricialdi's 24 studi per flauto, which were both written by, for the flutes invented by their authors. After the turn of the century, methods for the Böhm flute became increasingly common in Italian as Italian flutists somewhat begrudgingly accepted the Böhm flute. In addition, the flute also impacted how flutists wrote music for the instrument, as they generally took the qualities of whichever model they played into account while composing. Although much of the experimentation and innovation of the 19th century Italian flutists did not have a lasting impact on the physical instruments we use today, these flutes did influence the method and methods and repertoire, some of which are still performed and studied. The rapid developments that the flute and flute culture experienced in the 19th century came to a rapid halt with the onset of World War I, as happened with many other cultural activities. Italian flutists began accepting the Berm flute with much higher frequency and without the resistance that the instrument faced in the previous century. This relatively brief period of experimentation came to an end, but it last, left lasting impacts on the flute world. Ricciardi's B flat thumb key became standard on Berm flutes, the Italian methods provided precedence for the still popular French methods, and some of the vast repertoire composed in, it, in Italy is still played to this day. Studying Italian flutists' concerns and the instruments they played can lead to a deeper understanding of this repertoire and how to play it, as I experienced preparing for my undergraduate senior recital 
which featured pieces by Bricialdi, Ciardi, and Albizi, among others. Knowing the tendencies of the instruments gives clues as to why a composer wrote the piece the way they did, and whether a piece was written with a professional or amateur flutist in mind. The physical instruments can also provide some insight into the performance practice of the era. Even more influential in decoding these practices, however, are the flutist's preferences when discussing the instruments. The constant mentioning of certain elements, homogeneity of tone, intonation, fingering systems, and most importantly, a voice like tone quality, can all provide invaluable evidence of how flutists may have approached this repertoire. Although some of these aspects may prove more challenging on modern instruments, and we will never know exactly how these flutists performed, contemplating these questions is vital when confronting any new piece of music from this period. Thank you. You mentioned earlier in your talk that uh, there was a shift over to equal temperament rather than just tuning. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if any of the flutes that you discussed relate to tuning. If, if they didn't, I suppose the presumption is that all the flute is just adapted to equal temperament by ear. Yeah, I would imagine it was mostly by ear because until the Burm flute, um, he was really the first one to place the keys according to acoustics and how they would play most in tone, in tune, sorry, in um, equal temperament. Um, but a lot of times, early flutes, the holes would be placed based on where the particular creator's fingers were comfortable, which is why playing a lot of early flutes, for those of us with smaller hands, is very uncomfortable. Um, so I think even before equal temperament, just tuning in general for flutists was usually done by ear because you could not really rely on where the holes were placed. Um, but with the berm flute coming in, that all changes and it's all acoustic based, which is why there's so many keys on the berm flute so that the fingers can actually play them. Um, and Bricialdi kind of then took that design as well and that was kind of the basis for his own flute. So, Samantha, do you know, uh, say, in, of the major conservatories and major orchestras in the mid-19th century, who played which flute? And what, you know, how, did that influence, say, Verdi or other composers, Donizetti at the time? Yeah, so I do, I have found some references to some flutists and which instrument they played. Um, but not so, mostly with like the famous concertizers who are mostly playing the virtuosic repertoire and composing the virtuosic repertoire. A lot of them didn't necessarily play in one, play in one single orchestra. Um, for example, Bricialdi, he kind of moved around with orchestras. Um, but it was often the case where you'd have a flute section where no single two flutes were the same in the section, um, which was also the case in Germany, Austria as well. Um, not so much in France because you had the one central conservatory that had the berm flute and they were like, we're doing this. And so most of the French musicians played the berm flute. But um, yeah, so it's difficult to determine which flute the various composers were familiar with, which I found out in my very first paper on, in my very first music history class when I looked into the solo in um, the fourth movement of Brahms' fourth symphony to figure out why he wrote that for flute, and that's when I discovered, you know, we, we never know. It, we're, there were multiple flutes playing multiple instruments at the same time in any given orchestra, so. Yeah, I, I think it's my impression that that actually is true of the flute you know, well into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, uh, that was an amazing thing when I realized that, that uh, it, it didn't matter that much. Yeah, if I mean, you both even, played the same Yeah, instrument. even now we, you see in orchestras, you have you know some musicians playing wooden flutes, some musicians playing metal flutes, and it really doesn't matter too much. And there are ways to make the flutes blend, even if they're not made of the same materials or the same type of instrument. Mm 